Hello. So I'm going to share a bit about, well, first of all, I'm going to give you a skin update. Then I'm going to share a bit about my nutritional approach during topical steroid withdrawal. And I'm going to share my learnings with you. And then if you are considering what is best for you to do nutritionally speaking and you're feeling confused and you just want someone's perspective who's gone through it then i will share with you the things that i think might be helpful but first i'm going to eat my lunch and then i'll be with you So I'm back. I, I just changed because I realized I have to go climbing. We do, I do indoor climbing. So I'm climbing with my partner, my boyfriend, uh, shortly. So this is going to be a quick run through. Okay, so my update, as you can see, my skin has improved. If you've seen my previous videos, I'm 20 months uh, free of all steroids. And overall, my skin's doing a heck of a lot better. Life has improved, sleep has improved, um, more positive experiences on a whole. My hands look dirty, they look filthy, but actually what's going on here is I am using a herbal formula and it's brown. So it just gets stuck in all the dry skin and all the cracks and it, it makes my skin look dirty, but it's not dirty. I'm very hygienic and I'll, I'll do a separate post on my topicals uh, another time. My background is I was super healthy before I developed topical steroid addiction. So I've actually got a um, BSc honors in nutritional therapy and I'm busy with my um, MSc in personalized nutrition. So I come from a very healthy way of eating. And yet one day, early 2020, I started to develop really bad eczema and no amount of my hydrocortisone, over-the-counter hydrocortisone would keep it at bay. And so I just kept on putting more and more on. I saw the dermatologist and he was convinced I just have really severe eczema. We did patch testing. I did a skin culture, like nothing was showing up. And so I panicked. I was eating healthily. My skin was flaring. My dermatologist keeps telling me it's just eczema that we have to try and control with more steroids. And against my better judgment, I started doing very restrictive diets. I also have gone through topical steroid withdrawal before. 22 years ago, it was a time when there was no information really available. Certainly, we didn't have social media platforms like we do today. But what I did notice is that when I changed my diet to a much healthier diet, and then I did a particular um, dietary approach, which I will talk about another time. But what I noticed was that that was the biggest factor that helped me recover from topical steroid withdrawal. And that's why I believe that diet and nutrition can really help in the healing process. I'm sure if you've been in the topical steroid withdrawal community for a while, you will have heard about all of these diets. The eczema diet by Karen Fisher, the carnivore diet, paleo AIP, intermittent fasting, the anti-candida diet. What else did I try? Vegan whole food diet, celery juice, cabbage juice. So I was quite like hardcore with these things. The Karen Fisher diet, which is actually it's like a low chemical diet. So I ended up restricting amine rich foods and salicylates. So what does that mean? That is no aged cheeses or, or mature cheeses, no fermented foods, no aged meats like salami, ham, sausages, no meat that's been sitting for a long period of time, no shellfish, no legumes, no nuts. There were a few nuts that could be okay, but generally no nuts, no vinegar, no citrus, no cocoa or chocolate, no papaya, no pineapples, plums, kiwi, bananas, no tomatoes, no eggplant, no spinach, no ready meals, no additives, no caffeine in any of its forms, no yeast, no alcohol. On top of that, I was avoiding salicylate foods. Hello, salicylates are a compound that are found in most fruits and vegetables. I was having no herbs or spices other than salt for a good few months, no fruit other than pears and apples and a little bit of pomegranate and berries occasionally. Most vegetables had to be avoided because they've got contained salicylates and all teas, like no matter what tea. So for a good solid few, like almost a full year, I was following those principles and my skin did not clear. Uh, 
in the end, I actually ended up developing deficiencies in vitamin C and certain B nutrients, which I found fascinating. I found that out from doing a, um, a functional laboratory analysis um, called an organic acid test. Yeah, so also avoiding the major allergens. But what I was eating was apples and pears, occasionally berries and pomegranate, meat, chicken and lamb. I don't like fish, so I wasn't eating fish, unfortunately, but I was supplementing with a good quality omega-3 fatty acids. I was making my own bone broth, but super, super fresh. So I put in my Instapot, which is a pressure cooker, cooks within three hours, and then I'd um, compartmentalize them, package them away into uh, the freezer and have them as I take them out. Um, I was having ghee, potatoes, leeks, celery, Brussels sprouts, chives, spring onion, carrots, cabbage, lettuce, bok choy, turnips, green beans, mushrooms, and some garlic. No other veg. When I wasn't paleo AIP, I was having legumes and gluten-free grains. When skin still wasn't getting better, you know, so I would go back to paleo AIP and avoid those things. It was just ridiculous. I'd occasionally have pumpkin seeds, linseeds, and chia seeds. Occasionally I'd have a carob powder, natural vanilla extract, xylitol, stevia, and tapioca flour, like if I was going to bake something. I, it was just such a limited diet and at the end of the day I was really desperately unhappy I mean I come from an Italian background and here I am limiting even foods like olive oil um because it's high in salicylates and I ended up developing massive fear of foods certain foods and um it just made things a lot more difficult never mind the fact that I was developing nutritional deficiencies. There are a few small studies to support um, low salicylate diet as well as a low amine diet for itchy skin conditions, but these are small studies. And there's also literature discussing downsides to following such restrictive diets. There are small studies to evidence low allergen diets for eczema. As far as paleo AIP diet is concerned, there is some research available that looks more at inflammatory bowel disease and autoimmune conditions and don't address populations with eczema or topical steroid withdrawal. But I do want to say that there is no one diet for topical steroid withdrawal. Each individual has to be addressed as an individual. What I did experience that was positive was um, the carnivore diet was interesting. Against all my nutritional sensibility, I decided to try this diet because it, it had some good reviews. My skin got quite a, like significantly better, but I couldn't stick it out for longer than a few weeks at a time. I found it like really way too much animal products. And on top of that, my stomach just never really felt right. I'll do a separate post on kind of breaking that down a little bit. Uh, intermittent fasting, maybe not the best approach. I think we have probably gotten a certain amount of adrenal stress that we're under and intermittent fasting does put additional stress on the body so so it's not really ideal I believe for topical steroid withdrawal so yeah I you know abstaining from eating foods for some period of time is not a terrible idea we don't need to be consuming the whole time um, so maybe 12 to 14 hour max fasts would be sensible Yeah, and I suppose uh, at the end of the day, my learnings are that if I had the opportunity to do it all over again, I would seek out the support of someone who understands topical steroid withdrawal and who has a, a clinical background in nutrition. But they would need to really understand topical steroid withdrawal and have experience with it as much as is, is possible at this point in time. If they, you know, if we decided to go on to a restrictive diet, I would want them to handhold me through that process of reintroducing foods because when we go through topical steroid withdrawal, there's so much inflammation and discomfort. You're possibly experiencing it now if you're watching this video that it's almost terrifying to start to reintroduce foods if you've eliminated a whole lot of stuff because you're scared you're going to react to everything. But 
that's dangerous because it can lead to nutritional deficiencies and orthorexia, which is just a psychological shit show. I'd suggest that you look into Jennifer Fugo's SSR program or it's SRR program. She is a very well-known nutritional therapist. Uh, you can look up Skin Interrupt as well. It's just a really great starting point to start to understand uh, like the biochemical processes that could be contributing to um, your, if you're feeling hypersensitized to different foods and environmental factors. Secondly, I, I am pro having adequate protein in the diet. And what that looks like to me is that the, the current RDA may be adequate for healthy individuals, but people going through topical steroid withdrawal, like the skin loss, just that exfoliation, shedding of skin is so huge. And some of us get uh, sarcopenia, which is like some degree of muscle wasting and, and weight loss. It, it, to me, it makes sense that we increase our protein intake and pay extra attention to getting one to one and a half grams of protein per kilogram of body weight every day. And what that looks like, practically speaking, is that you know, like an egg contains six to seven grams of protein, or 100 grams of chicken contains around 30 grams of protein. It's just food for thought. It does require a bit of understanding of how much protein is actually in each type of food. The other thing I would strongly suggest is eating as whole food diet as one can, so staying away from all the additives and refined and processed sugary foods and all that jazz, like that doesn't need to be in our diet and to have as varied a whole food diet as possible. The other thing I would say is so omega-3 fatty acids can be quite helpful and it might be worthwhile looking at Alessio Fasano's work. Gluten can increase intestinal permeability to some extent in individuals irrespective of whether they are clinically gluten sensitive or not, so it might be worth considering. Great guys, I'm so sorry to rush through that, but um, I, I will stay in touch with new posts. Yeah, and I, I really wish you all the best on your healing journey. Hi again. So yesterday I shot that video and then this morning I woke up and I was like, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I haven't really shared with you and I don't want to feel like I'm leaving you hanging. You know, many of you might have a prior skin condition, which by way of stopping using the cortisone, which by the way is biochemically cortisol essentially in the body. So you've stopped taking this cortisone and your, your prior skin condition has flared. There are also other biological processes that are likely contributing to topical steroid withdrawal that we don't understand right now, but it would be really pertinent to consider what your underlying skin condition was um, if you had one. So you, you don't have the cortisone, which was dampening the inflammation in the body and your body's fighting really hard to find the equilibrium again. So how can you, what can you do to support your body in that healing process during topical steroid withdrawal? And to use atopic dermatitis as an example of what potentially could be going on, you know, with atopic dermatitis, we have genetic abnormalities which can trigger inflammatory cytokine production, so the production of in inflammatory molecules that's part of our immune system. Uh, it can also cause a compromised skin barrier. So you might be considering, well, what factors might be triggering these genetic expressions and uh, diet can come into play there. You know, when I'm considering food and nutrition, I'm thinking like, how can I use food and nutrition to help reduce the inflammation in my body? How can I use food and nutrition to, um, to help promote a healthy skin barrier? And yeah, so I suppose that's where my focus is uh, when I'm thinking about topical steroid withdrawal and nutrition. So the obvious thing that comes to mind is, do you have IgE food reactions? Are you, do you have true allergy to certain things? Now, I went and I did a total IgE test um, through my primary care provider. I saw that I had elevated IgE. And so then I went to get a broad food panel test, IgE test done to see if there were certain foods that I was truly allergic to. And it turned out I'm allergic to egg. 
So it, it's super important to avoid true food allergens if you, you have a true food allergy, uh, because that'll just perpetuate inflammation in the body and the itch and the, the aggressiveness of the skin disorder. Then yesterday, I kind of, I, I'm more focused on these very, these restrictive dietary eliminations. I didn't talk about uh, IgG food sensitivities. So often people will go, and you might even be considering it right now, is going to get um, a food panel that looks at what foods you are having IgG immunological reactions to. Now, this is really an area of heated debate in the nutrition space. I've heard plausible arguments to support it, and I've heard plausible arguments to counter the use of those those te kind of tests. And what I will say is that if you're working with someone who's putting you on any restrictive diet, it's very important that they are helping you address the physiological issues that are making you more, more sensitive to those foods. For example, supporting your liver detoxification processes, also supporting microbiome health. You know, if you've got an imbalanced microbiome, that can trigger intestinal in, intestinal permeability, as well as just the production of inflammatory cytokines in, and immune reactivity. And so you come to understand that it's not necessarily the foods that are the problem. It's those processes um, underlying your food sensitivities that actually need to be addressed. And if you choose to do those in unison, find but don't just do a dietary elimination on its own. And so that brings me to talking about nutritional sufficiency. Uh, you know, I mentioned yesterday that when I did an organic acid test, I identified that I was low in vitamin C and certain B, B nutrients. And I found that really shocking uh, because my diet was quote unquote healthy in that I was eating whole foods, but I wasn't getting enough of the right foods to support those nutrient repletions. And in addition to that, going through topical steroid withdrawal, I very likely had higher requirements for those those nutrients. So yeah, nutritional sufficiency. Do you have adequate protein, like I spoke about yesterday? Uh, you're going to need that for a healthy skin barrier. You're going to need that to help produce immune cells, hormones, and important enzymes. Do you have enough of the nutrients to support adrenal function? We need to make sure that we've got adequate vitamin C, B nutrients, magnesium. Do you have adequate levels of vitamin C and zinc for the production of collagen? Never mind the amino acids that are required for that. So amino acids are building blocks for a protein. So once again, protein plays a role in collagen synthesis. Do you have uh, enough of the right fatty acids to help manage the inflammation that happen is happening in your skin? So those might be your omega-3 fatty acids, uh, which counter the inflammatory effects of omega-6 fatty acids, for example. Do you have adequate levels of vitamin E? It's an antioxidant. What about other antioxidants that are really important to help quell the free radical damage that is occurring on your skin, in your skin? And so, yeah, there, there's a lot of different complex aspects to consider nutritionally, but I think the reason I'm saying listing all these nutrients and how they link to functions in the body is just to kind of highlight areas that may not be highlighted by some proponents of very restrictive diets. You know, their focus is on taking out things that might be aggravating your skin disease versus I like making sure that you have adequate nutrition to support your body's biological processes that are working so hard to heal you. And then it's so important to consider that diet isn't the only factor, right? Exercise can help reduce inflammation. Adequate sleep is so important. Are you drinking alcohol? Are you a smoker? Lots of research to support the role of stress reduction. Do you have secondary skin in infections that are causing flares? Are there environmental factors like dust mites or, or chemical irritants in the products that you're using on your skin when you're washing? Having an inflammatory skin disorder like topical steroid withdrawal is so much more than just diet, but diet, I believe, is one very, very important component. It's a tool that we can use to help support our healing process. And then I suppose I want to say that I do understand what it's like to not have endless funds so that you can actually go and find this high level support that, that I, 
ideally talking about, you know, to go and find a nutritional therapist or a functional dietitian or a naturopath who's going to work with you during the full course of your topical steroid withdrawal, that can be quite expensive. The lab analysis and supplementation is very expensive. And so a lot of you might be considering or choosing to do it alone, and it has to be fine for some of us. But if you are in a position to, uh, to go and seek out that kind of support, I highly recommend it. If you are doing it on your own, then just kind of consider the complexity of what I've been talking about. That's when those general suggestions that I made come into play. I didn't talk about hydration. I, I know that in the topical steroid withdrawal community, moisture withdrawal is one approach. I personally didn't go that route, but I really believe that fluid intake is super important. I, I mean, those would be a really good starting point. And if you are really concerned about certain dietary triggers for inflammation in your skin, then keep a food diary. It helped me identify that I was super, super sensitive to pecanuts, cherries. I would have some milder but significant reactions to gluten when I ate too many days in a row. Sugar would send me into flares, coffee. Yeah, and then I realized that I probably left you hanging around the carnivore diet. I, I would say that if that is something you want to experiment with, possibly, you know, like the way I would do it is I would... If my skin was flaring really badly, I would do the carnivore diet for a few days to a few weeks, and then I and then I would introduce back wholesome food. And I know that this is an area for heated debate, but I just believe that there's not enough research to support a, a carnivore diet long term. And then I suppose the other thing I would say is if you're considering the carnivore diet, eat nose to tail. So eat eat organ meats, make yourself some bone broth. There you can put in the sinewy parts and you might put in things like, ew, gross, like chicken feet and, and ugh, you know, if you're eating a carnivore diet, you want to eat nose to tail. So eat liver, etc., etc. Yeah, and I'll do a separate post on that. Yeah, those are my learnings over the course of topical steroid withdrawal. I'm still learning. I hope that some of what I've said is helpful and food for thought for you. I hope that I haven't just added to the stress and anxiety of, you know, the complexity. Like nutrition is so complex and there's so much conflicting information out there. And I really do empathize with you if that's how you're experiencing it. I really just want to actually bring it back to a space that you have some level of control. And that would be to control the quality of your diet and control the diversity of your diet and just like kind of pay attention to some of the points that I did mention. And then if you're in a position to, you can seek out professional support uh, to help you with the more complex uh, biochemical imbalances that could be playing a role in your skin inflammation. So yeah, guys, thanks so much for listening and um, leave your comments below and I'll definitely respond. Uh, I wish you all the best on your skin journey.